Hey friends, my name is Carrie Ann Barrett. I am a child of God and I'm here to help people share their stories for God's glory. Because when you hear a testimony of God moving in power in someone's life, it encourages you and it helps you to have hope again, no matter how dark things get. I have a new guest on tonight. It's always a new friend. And tonight is Cody Campbell. Cody Campbell has such an amazing story that God has really interceded and, and moved in power in his life. His story proves that you can start out as a Christian and still hit rock bottom. But even when you do, God can still reach you. And he did. Let me have Cody tell his story. Welcome, Cody Campbell. Welcome, friends. My name, as you know, is Carrie Ann Baird, and I am here with a new friend, and he's going to tell his story for God's glory. He really has a wonderful story, and so I want you to like, share, and subscribe. Go ahead and do me a favor and give me a thumbs up, because you know that that drives the audience to these videos, and we, I want people to know these stories. I want people to share in watching and know that there's hope and goodness and encouragement because of God. So please do that, like, share, and subscribe. But the story that I have tonight is a new friend, like I said, Cody Campbell. And he is going to share how even being a Christian, even raised in a Christian home, sometimes thinking things can go wrong and you can end up in the bottom. But even in the bottom, God can find you and bring you back again. So here he is. Welcome, Cody. Hi, Gary. Happy to be here. Awesome. I'm just so happy to have met you. It's been fun to connect and to hear your story. Why don't you tell a little bit about who you are today and then we'll kind of go into how you got there. Yeah, awesome. So um, my name is Cody Campbell. I'm 31 years old. I live in Jonesboro, Arkansas, um, where I work for a large church here in Jonesboro and I serve on the media team. Basically, I do i utilize my undergrad degree and so i do the lighting um some sound but also implementation to get sunday ready um, i'm also in seminary to lord willing be a pastor one day got one more year left i attend southern baptist theological seminary up in louisville kentucky and then i'm also on TikTok. so i think that's where you first found me absolutely and, yeah yeah so i'm on TikTok trying to to talk about jesus sharing my story playing some bible trivia um, but most importantly, trying to shine a light for Christ. Amen. And yeah, your TikToks are so powerful, Cody. I was really drawn in like, wow, this guy's got a presence. He's got a story. And I really wanted to share that here. So your story, it doesn't, you know, you're going to school to be a pastor, but your story really kind of doesn't look that way for a long time. Even though you're <laughs> raised in a Christian home initially, yeah. can you share when, when did the story begin? Ooh, okay, so you you kind of touch on it already. So um, I often tell people, had you known me five or six years ago, you would have known a very different person. Before Christ got a hold of me, um, I was a self-described angry atheist. I wanted nothing to do with the church, nothing to do with God, nothing to do with Christians. Um, this was partly because, I mean, I identified as a homosexual. And since I was 13 years old, I had come out at 13 and lived that way. And because of that one, again, wanted nothing to do with Christians. But then also I was in addiction. And so I, so I was, I, I joke with my friends and tell people I was basically the hat trick, right? So I, I was the atheist, I was in addiction, but I also identified as a homosexual. And so that's, that's who I was pre-Jesus. Yeah, but that story didn't end there. You know, no. a lot that changed. So where do you want to start? Do you want to start there or the beginning? So I think, yeah, well, so let's, let's start at the beginning. So um, as you touched on, um, I, I grew up here in Jonesboro, Arkansas. We're in the Northeast corner, about an hour outside of Memphis, Tennessee. And I, I grew up in a Christian home. I mean, I, my mom had attended church all growing up. Um, she is a Christian and she had us in church, um, really every time the doors were open up until I was about 12 years old. Now, all of a sudden though, I, I looked, I talked to mom and I asked like, why did we stop going to church? 
because for some reason about when I was 12 years old, we just stopped going one day, but I grown up knowing about God, knowing to pray, um, and somewhat, so weirdly enough, like somewhat hearing about Jesus, but not having a full grasp of who Jesus is, that he is God. Um, but definitely, again, still growing up in this Christian home. But as I said, um, as I said earlier, at 13, I came out as gay. And that's kind of when these, these issues started um, happening between me and any sort of semblance of faith. What I, I often tell people is the first time I can remember praying is being 13 years old, recognizing that the desires that I was having um, were, were wrong and also recognizing that I didn't want to live that way. And so praying to God to take them away. Now, that well, was even even at 13, you were praying to God who you didn't really know to take those desires away. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So I can remember being on my mom's bed and. And really, just because my family growing up, um, we're no longer this way, but we were somewhat legalistic growing up. And so I can just really remember, um, this was back, I guess, early 2000s, late 90s, early 2000s. But um, I just remember being terrified that knowing that God was real at, at 13, but also being terrified that he hated me. And so wanted so desperately for these desires to go away. And so, yeah, that was one of the first prayers I prayed. Um, but again, because we stopped going to church, slowly but surely, I began to fall away from any semblance of faith. I would go on and off with friends um, in high school. So I can remember being 16 and attending church with friends. But, but again, obviously, faith was not religion. I would have sometimes have these philosophical conversations with friends about religion or is there a God, et cetera. And so obviously that was not a huge part of my life. Right. It was college when I officially broke away. Right. Yeah. So in college, I, as, as my grandmother might say, I was too smart for my own good. And I hit a place where, again, I'd been, I'd been wrestling with this idea of trying to, trying to be gay, but then also trying to hold on to some sort of Christianity. I can remember watching documentaries in college on how can you be gay and be a Christian at the same time. But, but really in college, um, the struggle came to a head when I felt like I had sit on, sat underneath these professors, underneath these mentors, and it almost they almost made me feel as if um, if I wanted to succeed, if I wanted to be anything in life, I needed to let go of any semblance of faith that I had. Mm -hmm. Only the ignorant were Christians, only the uneducated. But if I wanted to be an intelligent person who contributed to society, who who actually loved people, then I would let go of of what little faith I had. Mm -hmm. And so that's when things began to chip away. I'd sat underneath a professor who talked about deism, this idea that God wound the clock of creation and sort of stepped back. And I thought, you know what? If there is a God, that's the God I believe in because clearly he has no say in what's going on. Also during this time, I became kind of an activist on my on my college campus i at one point in time for a year was the pet president of our gay straight alliance and so i would often go toe to toe with some of these christian organizations this was also at the height of the gay marriage debates and all i thought at the time was these christians don't want me to be happy who are they to dictate um how i'm supposed to live my life who are they to dictate my future, right? And so I would just, again, go toe to toe um, with them and slowly but surely that break, it just gets further and further and further apart. Right, um, Cody, it sounds like that the, your relationship with God really wasn't there. It's just like this, where you do this because this is what we're supposed to do because there's really. a God and he demands these things. Is that kind of yeah. what it was? No, yeah, totally. I mean, it was definitely, um, I say any semblance of faith in that, 
just I was very unsure if there could be a God, but I didn't necessarily want there to be a God because I didn't want to have to answer to him. Um, but again, yes, this legalistic idea that if there is a God, these are obligations we have to go through. But again, slowly but surely, though, I began just to fall away even more. And so moving from these agnostic sort of waters of maybe there is a God, maybe there's not a God, to full-blown atheism, right? So I also during this time fell into addiction, but also um, found some semblance of love, right? So I ended up meeting an ex of mine, and we had been together for three and a half years, but our relationship started in college. Well, he was an atheist. And so he was kind of that last straw. I just remember um, we would have discussions about, about faith or God, et cetera. And I, again, would go back to this, I kind of feel stupid for believing in God. And so he was finally in him. I felt like I had everything that I needed. So I no longer felt like I needed to believe in a God. And so it was with getting with him, being in that relationship that I officially broke away and said, you know what, I don't believe in God at all. Um, because in college, I would joke with friends and though I'd sort of wavered and struggled in, in maybe I believe, maybe I don't believe, the one thing I couldn't shake were coincidences. And, and so I would joke with my friends and say, you know, it's like there's someone up there writing my story I just didn't want to believe it was God, right? Because I couldn't shake the fact that being a, I was a theater major, being a theater major, I would look at the world and I would look at just these seemingly impossible events that seemed to have coincide in such a way that it looks like it was scripted. And I couldn't deny there was something there, right? And yet, because of all this chipping away, I eventually did move into full-blown atheism. Mm. So how did it go from you're you're walking that life you're you're happy living in that life it seems and yet it didn't stay happy so what went on after that um, my life fell apart <laughs> okay that's what happened no no so again so and i love i love that you mentioned because in many of my videos i talk about my past and moving from my past and and people were like well maybe he was questioning or maybe he wasn't happy no, I was perfectly content in the life I was living. I was perfectly content in not believing in God. I was perfectly content in abusing my pills. I was perfectly content in being a homosexual and being in a relationship. But, right, but God didn't let me stay that way. And what I've learned through reading the Bible and what I've learned in my own life is God will sometimes shake up our lives to get our attention or he will allow our lives to be shaken up to get our attention. And that's what happened. So I end up, um, so I go to Arkansas State University, which is in, which is in my hometown. And I graduate in 2015. And it's a miracle that I graduate truly, because again, I, at this point, am a walking addict. And I honestly, I think my professors just passed me. Now, it was my dream at the time to be a Disney producer. And so I'd spent really to the last two years of college, really organizing my life and orienting my life to, to get an internship with Disney and maybe one day follow in the footsteps of some of my mentors and become a Disney producer. Well, part of that, what that entailed was moving out to California. I had learned that at the time that Disney, for my specific spot in the internship, they were only hiring interns in and around the, the Southern California area. And so I was like, you know what, let's, I told my ex, let's pick up, let's move to California and let's see what happens, right? Well, that's exactly what we did. I graduated that summer of 2015. We moved um, to California, into Pasadena, but that's, but California, I often talk about my California saga. California is when my life fell apart. That fall, um, my, my ex and I, our relationship was kind of on the rocks already. Well, that fall, we end up breaking up. And at first it was amicable, but it quickly turned south. And um, unfortunately, not to go into all those details, but things just got really, really messy. And so um, already there was some devastation there. And also what came with that is I was alone in California. And so I end up actually moving out of our apartment 
and while starting this internship with Disney. Well, starting this internship, um, again, just being alone, but also being an addiction, um, the bottom fell out from underneath me. So I was, we were probably a month, I was a month into the internship and there was one weekend in particular that I can look back and say, that's when it started. Mm. So one night after work, I'm going to the pharmacy and at the time, so being an addiction, I would basically abuse my medications. And then sometimes I would fly into these, these rages and I would just get angry at complete strangers, family members, whatever. Well, that night I end up, unfortunately, taking out a lot of my anger and aggression on these four homeless people. I parked my car, they were right there, they were in the line of fire, and I just let them have it for no reason. Well, I feel awful about it. So I go inside the pharmacy, um, buy them some water, come back and just begin to talk to them, right? I, I apologize for, for what I'd said, I'm handing them water, I'm making small talk, et cetera. Well, there was a lady there who kept her head down. And at the time I was like, well, that lady's on something or that lady, I don't know, something's wrong with her. Well, at, I had mentioned that I was from Arkansas. I'd introduced myself and I was like, hi, my name's Cody and I'm from Arkansas. The second I said that I was from Arkansas, she jerked her head up and she goes, Jonesboro? <laughs> my, my mind was blown, right? So of all the, places, right? Of all the right, places. Didn't believe in God, right? But I still couldn't shake those coincidences. And so I believed in the universe. Well, at the time I thought the universe was trying to tell me something. So I stuck around there for just a little bit longer and it turns out she has a son in Paragold, which is just a town like 20 minutes away. Well, I stuck around there and these end up meeting these two guys. Well, I'm befriending these two guys and they robbed me blind. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that that is what kickstarted it, right? So I get robbed blind this night because I hang out outside of a pharmacy thinking the universe is trying to talk to me, get robbed blind. Well, what this kickstarted was a crazy series of events. Basically, I then was homeless for two months because when they robbed me, they took my phone, they took my laptop. Eventually I got locked out of my bank account. I got locked out of my credit cards and not to mention I'm alone. Well, also added to this, I ended up meeting this stranger who he, he helps homeless people is kind of what he tells me. And so he takes me underneath his wing. I'm living with him out of motels. Um, sometimes we're, we're sleeping on people's couches or I'm sometimes sleeping in my car, et cetera. And I'm, he takes me under his wing and we're living life together for like two months, me and him and a couple other people. Well, it turns out he was a con artist, right? And he was actually part of that initial robbery. And so that was just crazy in and of itself. And in my life, again, I just rock bottom, rock bottom, rock bottom, and just keep going lower and lower. Right. Every time you thought, every time you thought there was a bottom, it just one level down. Right, right, right. It's just, and it's just, it's insane at what all, what all happened, what all went through. Well, finally, the last straw, this con artist ends up stealing my car and not only stealing my car, but stealing my car and selling my car. And for me, that was the last straw. I end up quitting my job at Disney, calling my mom and telling her the truth. This, at, by this point, I'd been lying to her, basically telling her everything was okay. I was fine. Well, I had to fess up to everything and just let her alone. Like, no, I've been sometimes sleeping in my car or living in motel rooms or, and by the way, like I got robbed again. Right. And, and wait a minute, Cody, I mean, you had this, everybody would think you're, you've got this picturesque life because you're interning at Disney and Disney's just, right. you know, this magical kingdom and yet things weren't so magical for you. <laughs> no, not at all. Right. And poor, my poor friends at Disney, I was lying to them, telling them I was okay. And like, I'd got an apartment. They can never come to my apartment because it was really the motel <laughs> six, but neither here nor there. And so, um, but anyway, mom's mind's blown ish, right? She kind of knew what was up, but she, she wanted to believe I was okay. Well, so she thankfully um, scrounges up some money to get me on a Greyhound. And, and so I get on a Greyhound, I've quit my job, get on a Greyhound and take a Greyhound for like 48 hours from California back to Jonesboro, Arkansas. All I had to my name was a toothbrush and a stick of deodorant, right? 
But what this did, and it's one of those things looking back, I am so thankful, so thankful for that just crazy and epic time because this was the ground, this was the soil that God used to get my attention, mm -hmm. right? What I often tell people is, whether it's in a video or just talking to friends, sharing my story, is the way God got my attention was three, three areas, right? So coincidences, right? I'd already talked about how even since college, I couldn't shake a coincidence. So coincidences, the kindness of a stranger, and then his presence. Well, we've already seen one big coincidence, right? The woman who who somehow knew where Jonesboro, Arkansas was. And there were other little things along the way in California, right? There are some fun stories I've shared on my TikTok. But what really began to set me over the edge was this stranger I met coming back to Jonesboro. So coming back to Jonesboro, again, I had nothing to my name. I was mad at the world. I had my dream in the palm of my hands. I'd done it. I literally had lived the dream, got out of small town, Arkansas, moved to California and was on my way to, in my mind, be something, right? And yet it was taken from me, right? Well, so I blamed everybody. I blamed my mom. I blamed my siblings. I blamed the con artist, right? I blamed everybody except for myself because I did nothing wrong. Well, all the while, I'm just lashing out at my family. I'm pushing everyone away. Well, during this time, I end up meeting this complete stranger. He's back here in, Ar um, in Arkansas, in Jonesboro. And I tell him every gory detail of what had happened to me, right? And after hearing my story, he did something that surprised me, right? He didn't laugh. He didn't um, suggest that maybe like if I hadn't done this or if I'd done this, right? He just gave me a hug. He, I was on his couch and he gave me the biggest hug I'd ever received. And he tells me, you need clothes. And I say, thank you, sir. I know I need clothes. And he's like, no, no, no. right? No, no, no. Because I was, I was wearing my nephew's clothes at the time. So I was like, yes, thank you. The irony is not wasted on me. I need clothes. But he's like, no, I want to go buy you clothes. I was shocked, right? I immediately, teary-eyed started. Tears come to my eyes, but I'm also a little like hesitant because right. I think you just right. You just had these complete strangers that you were trusting really take you <laughs> for <Exactly>. everything. <laughs> right. so my, my guard was definitely up. Well, he's like, no, I want to go buy you clothes. Two weeks later, he took me shopping and bought me a whole new wardrobe. When I tried to thank him, he said, don't thank me. Thank God. Thank mm -hmm. God I was here. Thank God I had the money. Thank God I was willing to help, right? I was floored. Never had this kindness had been shown to me, and especially not since California, right? Well, so a couple of months go by, and again, at the time, I'm sobering up a little bit. I would have periods of sobriety, but periods also of where I'm heavy in addiction, abusing medications. Well, in one moment of clarity, I'm sending an apology to my brother for how I treated the family how I yelled at my mom, how I treated my niece and nephew, et cetera. Well, I'm typing out this long, long text message. The second I hit send, something weird happened. So I hit send on my phone and my mom pops into the living room and she says, there's someone on the phone for you. It was the California police department. They had found my stolen car. Wow. It, the, the timing was so perfect that I remember looking up at the ceiling and thinking, God, because it was just, it was so, so perfect that it just, it felt scripted, right? So here's yet another coincidence that God was using that summer. Well, no one in my family wanted to help me retrieve my stolen car because again, everyone knew I was an addiction. Right. To that same guy, that same guy ends up giving me thousands of dollars to fly out to California, get my car out of impound and drive it back to Jonesboro. When I get back, he's not done because he's like, you need to get back to work. And I was like, yeah, I know. Well, he's like, what do you need? He ends up buying me a brand new MacBook computer. When I tried to thank him again, don't thank me. Thank God. Thank God I was here. Thank God I had the money. Thank God I was willing to help. Because of that man, practically a complete stranger, right? I'd only known him for a couple of months. Because of that man's kindness, 
I began to believe that there could be a God again, mm -hmm. right? A couple more months go by and a few more crazy coincidences happen. But the, the coolest thing of all, in my opinion, occurred on my aunt's couch. So I, again, come from this Christian family and I'm on my aunt's couch, one, telling her everything that happened to me in California, every gory detail, but also beginning to tell her of some of these crazy things and these coincidences that are beginning to happen. Well, as I'm telling her everything that happened to me, a moment in California that I'd forgotten, I'd remembered. And a couple of nights after I'd gotten robbed, I got on the wrong bus in California, which was easy to do, did not know the California bus system very well. But I've gotten on this bus, I have no idea what I'm doing, I'm scared out of my mind. Well, as I'm riding this bus, this feeling overwhelmed me. It was warm. Um, it felt like I was receiving a huge hug. It mm. felt like someone was talking to me, but I couldn't understand what they were saying. And though I had just been robbed, I remember thinking it's all going to be okay. Right. And so I got off the bus and just felt at peace on my aunt's couch that night, September of 2016 that same feeling overwhelmed me. I call it my God explosion right. because it was just, it was the presence of God. I right. did not realize it at the time on the bus, but it was, it was God's presence filling me, be poured out upon me. And I was just, I'm in tears, right? I was just bawling my eyes out on my aunt's couch. And I heard God speak into my heart for the first time. And I realized that God didn't hate me that God loved me and that God was calling me to follow him. Right. And so, but I also knew in that moment, I had lived my life as if I was the author of my story. I lived my life as if I was the main character. And yet in that moment on my aunt's couch, I realized my entire life's got to change. If God is real, then he's the author of my life wow. and he is who I'm accountable for. Right. I, I mean, did. that's huge. Yeah. Well, yes. Huge, massively huge. Right. And I, again, it was just, I just had this like understanding of everything's got to change. Right. Don't necessarily know the details. Don't know how, what, how all it's going to happen. I just now know that there is a God and I want to follow him. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that's how I went from being an atheist to at the very least realizing, yes, there is a God. Wow, right? Cody. I mean, just it's hard to really explain to people the the feeling that the immense fullness of his presence and how it really can change somebody to be completely the other way around. It's hard to explain. People wonder, why did you, you believe in God? And it's these encounters that it's like, you have no idea. Yeah, no, exactly, exactly. And I'm like, if you knew, if you... I wish that you, I'd had a camera with me at all times when all this is happening. And thankfully, right, when people are like question it or ask, I'm like, no, ask any member of my family, ask any of my friends or any of my former friends, right, who were with me during this time, because they at least got to see me talking about it or like being just shocked by it. Or my mom, my mom lived with me during the time and she lived through it. And so, yeah, it's pretty, it's life changing. Right. Is what I Right. It is. It's completely life changing. It's almost like God, you know, shuffles all the pieces and then you're like, okay, well, how do we put this back together again? <laughs> right. Absolutely. Well, and that's, that's, what's crazy, right? Is he didn't stop, right? He didn't just appear to me on my aunt's couch and then, and then just let me have at it. Right. What this kick started was a series of events of a, what would be my life newly changed, right? Or my life beginning a process of being changed. Now, Cody, did he feel like he accepted you all the way? Like, was there like, well, I accept you, but, you know, or was he just completely accepting? No. So um, that's a great question. So during that time, um, I just knew he loved me, right? That's, that's just, that's all I knew. I, I, all I walked away with realizing was that God loved me and he's real, yeah. right? It was then over the next course where I realized that I may have misunderstood some things and um, I needed to, to learn about who he is, right? 
And so that's what kickstarted the next leg of that race, right? And so, so even in the midst of all that, that you had all those things of your history that he loves you, right? He loves us. It doesn't really matter what we're doing, where we are, how rock bottom we are. He loves us. Absolutely. hundred percent, hundred percent. Yeah. yeah. So good. But he so loved me that. that I didn't stay where I was at. Right? right. And I think that that is huge because at the time, um, again, I, I often tell people, so I, I work, I don't work. I volunteer at a, a men's drug and alcohol addiction ministry. Right. Because one, I, I understand exactly where they're at, but then two, like, I just love these guys. I love teaching these guys and getting them excited about the Lord. But one thing I share with them is guys, you are not too far from the Lord, right? You are not too far from the Lord being able to 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 love you you are not too far gone for the lord be able to use you right i i'm like guys when god found me i was an atheist i was an addict and i identified as a homosexual right and so if he can use me if he can call me if he can save me he can save you right and he loves you mm -hmm. um but again he's not going to let you stay where you're at and i think that's what's so important so let's talk about that for a moment. How did he share with you that things needed to change, but you weren't feeling completely judged and running? Yeah. So, um, so over this next, so that was September, 2016. Um, God would then move me through a season of really his gentleness, right? Mm -hmm. Like looking back, I just realized how patient and gentle and kind our God is through how he dealt with me. So, a few short days after the my aunt's couch experience of my god's explosion right i i'm at my aunt's couch again or at my aunt's house and again still in addiction right unfortunately still abusing medication still doing all that well i feel god's presence again and i feel impressed upon my heart throw your pills on the ground and walk away at the time all i thought was god's real done right and i'm just dumping my pills on my aunt's yard and because the only thing i thought about was god's real and if this is what he's calling me to do i'm gonna do it at the time i would not have admitted to you that i was an addiction because to me the addict was someone who was addicted to meth or heroin i needed my medication right i have add like i needed those medications well I didn't need to be abusing them the way I needed to abuse them, right? Or the way I was abusing them. So I never would have told you I was an addiction. It would be months later, looking back, that I realized that that afternoon, when God told me to throw my pills on the ground, he broke that chain of addiction, right? Mm -hmm. Because since then, it's been over six years now, I've not abused a single medication, right? I'm not even on those medications anymore. I'm learning to live life without them, right? I'm not against medication but I'm recognizing that there are certain things that I, I don't even need to tempt myself with. Right. And so I'm learning to say no and, and lean on him when, when necessary. Right. And so that was just the first start. That was the first, the first I'm trying to say the first start in, in God beginning to move mm -hmm. in, in changing me and shaping me to be, to look more like him. Right. And so I didn't get off scot free though. Right. Um, you don't just quit a bunch of medications without without some issues. So I kind of went a little loopy there for a little bit. But again, thankfully, just very gentle and very, very kind and very uh, merciful um, as my poor family. Right. We, we sometimes look back at that time period and laugh at um, some of the craziness. But during this time, he also was guiding me to church. And so I remember feeling like I needed to be in a church. I needed to begin to read the Bible. I needed to begin to understand just who this God is that's calling me to serve him and, and live for him. And so I began to bounce around churches. I began to read the Bible. Well, okay. ultimately- oh, Can I stop you for one second? Cause I yeah. wanna, I wanna ask you about this church thing. So, you know, a lot of people struggle with, you know, <laughs> The homosexuals being in church being accepted so how do homosexuals go to church and not feel judged and some churches are totally open door and some churches are totally closed so how did you process that journey to get into a church that was willing to talk to you or what did you have a struggle with that so um 
at the time, it's funny you, you bring that up. So at the time, I would have told you I'm living proof that God is okay with homosexuality. I would have said I'm living proof that God is okay with gay people, right? But what I meant was basically saying that homosexuality isn't a sin, that God has approved homosexuality. And um, honestly, honestly, it was probably that naivety, that ignorance, that I just didn't really care. Um, I just knew that God was real, that God had called me, that God loved me. And so I was going to go sit in church, right? I was going to go read the Bible. Amen. And and so, but thankfully though, um, though we are smack dab in the middle of the Bible Belt, and though every one of these conchur- churches I went to would be conservative um, in their in their theology or traditional in their theology, every one of these churches now being in ministry, what I'm realizing is they're going to allow the homosexual to come through their door, right? They're going to allow the homosexual to participate in worship. Now, membership is another story, right? But they are not going to shut their door on anybody because of sin, right? Yeah, people need to know that, that, you know, you can still go even if you're in your journey. Oh, at hundred, hundred, hundred and ten percent, right? And so, um, and so, yeah, they would let me in. Now, they also realized, right, that something was up because, again, it was it was a crazy period, um, headwise anyway. And so, bounced around several different churches, began to read the Bible, began to understand who Jesus was, like that was huge, and ultimately landed at a Methodist church here in here in Jonesboro. And again, this is one of the Methodist churches that are probably more traditional in their teachings, more conservative in their teachings. Methodism is in the news right now because they're kind of breaking off. Well, this would have been more of a conservative or traditional Methodist church. But it was at this church that um, I was welcomed with open arms, right? They could tell, I often joke with friends, like if you met me, you would you would know, like I wasn't the straightest crayon in the box, right? But they never, they never brought it up, right? They saw someone that God was moving and they, they welcomed me, right? And, and all these churches had welcomed me. But this one, there were members of this church who began to take me underneath their wing. Mm-hmm. During this church and during this season, as I was reading the Bible, I learned about who Jesus Christ is, right? You don't sit under all these incredible pastors and begin to read scripture and not walk away hearing the gospel over and over and over again, I learned that Jesus Christ wasn't just some man, right? He wasn't just some man who died in political protest, as I may have thought prior to all these things that God was doing. Jesus is God, and Jesus was who was at work in my life and beginning to move and shape me and to to who he needed me to be, right? And, but I also recognize that Jesus is our savior. He died on the cross for us. He died on the cross because we and our sin needed, needed that salvation. We needed, he took our place to, to save us. And so um, I end up recognizing that Jesus is my Lord, that Jesus is my God. And I give my life over to him and devote my life to him, right? And all this occurs as I'm um, attending this Methodist church, getting, getting involved with this, this men's drug and alcohol rehabilitation ministry, and having these incredible people from the pastor's wife and the pastor to the associate pastor and his wife begin to take me underneath their wing, right? And all the while, God is opening door after door after door. It's actually a funny story how I first got started working in ministry. At the time, I was trying to book it back to California, get back on my track of working for Disney, being a producer, trying to be a producer, et cetera. And yet every time I tried to leave Jonesboro, the door would get shut in my face, right? The plans would fall through. Well, finally, I said, all right, I'll stay in Jonesboro. So I stick around and I'm getting in touch with this associate pastor at the Methodist Church. And the first thing he asked me is, so what do you do? And I'm like, well... I have a degree in lighting design. And he's like, I need a lighting guy for our worship services. Mm -hmm. And so through just a weird series of events, God, right? I end up, um, he takes me underneath his wing and he's my very first ministry job. And so he hires me on as his personal assistant. I'm doing some tech stuff for him for, for worship. And I felt like God was calling me to help him. And little did I know at the time, God was laying on his heart to, again, take me underneath his wing, right? 
So this beautiful of how God just really opened these doors and opened these relationships and these friendships. Um, so I give my life to Christ. I'm at the Methodist church. I'm now working in ministry. I still would have told you, right, that God was okay with me um, being gay, right? God was okay with me being a homosexual. Now, I didn't like broadcast that to the church. I didn't really broadcast that on Facebook. Um, I just kind of kept to myself. But, but slowly but surely, again, as I was reading scripture, God began to open my eyes to some things, right? I remember reading the Bible and certain things would stick out, like the fact that we're born into sin. Mm -hmm. So I remember going into my mom's room and saying, mom, did you know we were born sinful? And she's like, yeah. And I was like, I, I couldn't have articulated it then. But looking back, those gears were turning because I would have told you I was born gay. I would have told you I was born with, with these feelings and desires. And so therefore, God created me this way. Well, if because of the fall, we are born into sin, then that doesn't discount homosexuality, right? Just because I maybe these I have these desires since birth, but we have all sorts of sinful desires right. since birth. Right. 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 I mean, so, kids are selfish creatures and that's just right. normal. I mean, yeah. that's selfishness is a, is a sin. So yeah, we so all like, sin. And so, and so again, slowly, but surely it's not like he, he boomed, he didn't. So I often tell my guys who um, I'm working, who I work with through this addictions ministry, because it's not wasted on me. Like they're in a seven month program and here I am proclaiming to them. God told me to throw my pills on the ground and walk away, right? I really feel like that God did that because he knew the battle and the struggle that I was going to face, right? Because pills were not my identity. I was not in love with my pill bottle. However, homosexuality was my identity. And I was still very much in love with my ex. And I had dreams and aspirations of telling him about Jesus and worshiping God with him together right and so all the while though god slowly but surely and gently is chipping away at these false ideas and these false notions well it finally came to a head um and i can remember looking back and thinking all right if the pastor preaches on homosexuality that's my sign that i need to turn away right and so slow like i i was hitting that place well it finally came to a head as i was reading the bible and i was reading matthew 19 and in college, I'd mentioned that I'd watch these documentaries trying to um, justify being a Christian, but also identifying as a homosexual. And these documentaries would have said, well, we know what Moses says about homosexuality, talking about the Old Testament, Leviticus, all of that. And we know what Paul says about homosexuality, talking about Romans and, and the various passage in the New Testament. But Jesus never said anything, right? Jesus is silent on it. And so how can we say that Jesus is against homosexuality when he never speaks about it? Well, God, Jesus blows my mind with Matthew 19. So here I am reading Matthew 19. And if you're not familiar with it or those watching, Carrie, I'm sure you are. But um, Matthew 19 is where Jesus is talking, I believe, with the Sadducees. And he's talking about marriage and he's talking about divorce. Well, in that, though, we see how Jesus feels about not only homosexuality, but really any sexual sin, right? Because what he does here is he defines marriage. We see that he says, you've heard it said that they were created male and female. Well, my first thought as I was reading is there goes transgenderism. Mm -hmm. It's not a spectrum. God has made them male. God has made us male and female. It's a binary system. But then as I read down a little bit further, we see Jesus affirms biblical marriage. He affirms his definition of marriage that um, it is between one man and one woman. Now, we also see elsewhere in scripture where Jesus has, um, he speaks openly about sexual immorality and he defines sexual immorality going so far as to say, if you even look at another woman lustfully, You've committed adultery, right? Mm -hmm. And so we see several key passages of Jesus talking about sexual immorality. Now, it didn't all hit me then as I was reading it. It would take me a couple of weeks. 
But I remember getting ready for work one day and I believe it was the Holy Spirit. I believe, I just remember thinking, well, if God made the male and female, and if marriage is between one man, one woman, and any sexual relation outside of the marriage covenant is a sin, then dot, 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 right? Homosexuality is a sin. I remember dropping to my knees and just crying because I realized I was living in sin. I had spent months telling people that um, I was living proof that God was okay, that it was, it was okay. And yet here is God six, seven months later, bringing me to my knees very, very, very gently and helping me to realize that I was living in sin. Right. But how now, do you take that? If you're like, well, that's just God and I don't want to do that, or I'm doing my own thing. How did that work in you to come and change you? So awesome. So that's exactly what happened. So at the time, again, what I tell people is I was not in love with my pill bottle, right? I, but I was, it, homosexuality was my identity. I was still in love with people from my past. And, and so I didn't give it up right then and there, right? I knew I was living in sin and yet I still wanted to try to make it work. Well, it would be several worship um, worship services where God would just impress on my heart. I remember this college service I had attended with a buddy of mine and the, the student pastor who had gotten up and was filling in for the lead pastor, he was talking about Paul and how Paul basically had to leave everything in his past behind him to move forward with what God had called him to do. I don't remember half the sermon because God, the, the weight of God's conviction fell on me, right? I was like Jacob wrestling with God during the service and really feeling like God's like, no, like there is no, you can't, you can't justify it. You need to turn away from it. And, and so I'm sitting in the service thinking, fine, sure, fine, whatever. I'm just very frustrated, right? Don't recommend doing it. Yeah. Like don't, talking to God this way, right. but that's, that's how it occurred in the middle of this worship service. At least well, it was real. You were being real. Yeah. That's yeah, God that's, expects that. You basically, my thought was, um, you don't realize what you're asking me. Well, he's God. He knew exactly what he was asking of me. Well, a couple of weeks later, um, I'm at this, the worship service for the addiction ministry I work, I work for, or I volunteer for. And, um, during the service, it was during the altar call. And again, I felt God press upon my heart. Are you ready to die to this? Basically giving me that out. Like, is this it? Are you ready to turn your back on it? At the time I thought, yes, but you're going to have to carry me to that altar. Because again, do you realize what you're asking of me? Right? Well, sure enough, I found the strength. It was God, but he gave me the strength to go down to the altar and talk to my pastor's wife mm -hmm. and begin to share with her, look, I don't know what's happening. I don't know what God's doing. I feel different. I don't feel, I don't know. Right. I remember just being flabbergasted, but again, it was just at some level of my being, I understood that something in me had changed at the time. I would have told you I'm one of those miracle cases, right? In the same way that God broke that chain of addiction, he, he broke that chain of homosexuality and I was never going to struggle with it again. Right. And that was kind of the story for three months until the desires cropped back up again. Right. And what I realized and what I realize now and what I often tell people is what God gave me that night is the power to say no. Right. I'd spent so much of my life believing that this was my identity and this was how I was supposed to live that I didn't realize I could say no. Right. Well, gave me the power to say, that's not my identity. Right. I'm homosexual simply because I have same sex desires. God has called me to, I'm a child of God. That is first and foremost, my identity. And he has given me the will to not be defined by my sexual desires. And so I'm not going to choose to act on them. I'm not going to choose to be identified by them. Right. Wow. I mean, Cody, if you think about it, I was just thinking of David and how David's desires were for a woman that wasn't his. I mean, he saw right. a woman, he was like, oh, I want her. 
And Mm -hmm. he unfortunately gave in to those desires, but we all have desires and we don't necessarily need to always give in to them. 100%, 100%, right? Well, what, and what, just going a step further, um, and we can, we can hash this out um, later on when I, when, when the story is full, but um, just a little side note is the thing with sexual orientation and the thing with homosexuality or transgenders and bisexuality, right, is it's not even just a desire, right? It's they, they will say that your emotions or your desires is now your identity. And that's what makes it so hard to turn away from is that identity component. Now, Cody, I've talked to a few people about that we are made up of three parts. We are our flesh, we are our soul, and we're our spirit. I know okay. like our flesh sometimes wins battles. Our flesh is like, dude, I run the show. You eat when I want to eat. You do this when I want to do, you know, I go to the bathroom when I say so, and your body kind of runs things. And then our soul in the in, before Jesus, at least, is like, no, we also run things. We do what we want to do. Our, our desires, we do whatever we want. But when we become a Christian, our spirit connects with God. And God's like, you have the right to take over. You have the right to live the way I've called you to live. And so I think that's the journey that you're talking about, that your your spirit is like, wow, I think I want to do something different. And I bet you your flesh and your soul are like, well, no, no, we, we don't do different. This is who we are. This is what we do. Right. Well, there was definitely a wrestling. There was definitely a wrestling of my flesh. And that wrestling continues today, right? I mean, I still, to this day, have desires that I don't want to act upon. Right. I still have desires that I certainly don't want to be identified with or by. And but again, it's then leaning in on God and and trusting in in what he has called me to do and who he has called me to be. Mm, yeah. How much is it like when you go through addiction and you're like, no, I'm just going to live that way anymore. I'm choosing not to live with those desires. Yeah. So it's it's similar. Um, but I tell people again that it was easier for me to leave addiction than it was for me to leave homosexuality, right? I, and I think part of it has to do with, yes, it's, I've already mentioned the love component. I was in in love with my pill bottle, but then also in addiction, I saw those ramifications right in real time. I, I have gone to jail a couple of times because of my past. I, um, I've seen the brokenness that my addiction caused my family and my friends in my life, right? Though, yes, I am, um, though my rock bottom was because I was robbed and then conned and then crazy, crazy California story, right? It's not like, I also have to recognize that I was in addiction at the time. Maybe if, had I not been in addiction, I wouldn't have made some of the stupid decisions I made by trusting these people or going along with some of these things, right? And so addiction allowed me to see, um, I can see my brokenness because I have a track record of my brokenness. Whereas homosexuality, it's hard because it's spiritual, right? We don't see those ramifications. We don't see the harm that it's causing God, right? The Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit grieves, right, when we sin. And and we also do not see the eternal ramifications of sin, right? We see it through through Jesus' testimony. We see it through the revelation of the Bible. But unfortunately, we will not see, truly see those ramifications until we're on the other side, right? Mm -hmm. Do you see the ramification that that it would separate you from that intimacy with God? Was it a hindrance to your your walk and your your connection with him? So I saw it, I recognized it, and God allowed me to see it um, in that bathroom, in my bathroom getting ready that morning, right? I recognized that, and I also recognize it through the witness of of the Bible, through through the revelation of the word, right? Mm -hmm. Um, As someone who, again, since that night of, of my aunt's couch with recognizing that God was real and my life needed to change. I mean, I recognize I need to come under his authority, right? That's the language I would use now. I'm not sure if I'd used it then, right? But part of that meant, all right, I knew just from what little background I'd had in the church that the Bible's the word of God. And so if what the Bible says, and I'm going to orient my life and live it based upon how God has revealed himself in his word and how he's revealed for me to act and conduct my life. Mm -hmm. And so I recognize it through, through that as well. 
Was it worth it? 100%. 100%. No, it's, um, I get a lot of pushback on TikTok and I, I have to be careful about what I share on TikTok because of community guidelines. I often just, I don't get into the nitty gritty of why I believe what I believe or where I see it in scripture because TikTok doesn't allow you to. But I can at the very least talk about how this is who I was. This is who I am now. Well, a lot of the times um, people will push back and you must be so sad now or you must be so depressed or it, no, y'all. I The creator of the universe um, moved in my life, right? He saved my life. He showed me how much he loved me. He showed me that the path I was on was going to lead to hell right? And yet he chose to move in such a way and get my attention to save my life, yeah. right? I don't care what he's called me to do. I don't care what identity he's calling me to leave behind. The creator of the universe has saved me. I'm going to rejoice every single day because of that, right? <laughs> Amen. I love that so much. It's like, I know there's this emptiness that, that people have until they meet the creator God and they have that encounter. And he is the very fullness of that emptiness inside Cody. Wouldn't you say that he just fills those places? Yeah. I mean, my life has purpose. My, I mean, every day, I mean, yes, I go to work every day, right? I, I get up some days. I don't want to get up and I want to snooze the alarm, but at the end of the day, I mean, I recognize that there's a God, right? And he loves us and he, we have a purpose and that purpose is to glorify him and to worship him and to go out and proclaim to the world who he is. And so that's what I'm trying to do. Amen. Amen. Yeah. I love it, Cody. What would you tell people that are in that place of wrestle where they're like, yeah, maybe, but I don't know if I really want to, what would you say? So wrestling with the existence of God or just leaving behind identity or, or I guess what? I guess more the identity, because I mean, that's, that's kind of your story is, is, is changing your identity. So how would you share to people that aren't sure they're on the fence? Well, so um, if you're on the fence and if you're wrestling, I think you really, you need a heart check, right? And you really need to wrestle. And this is not something that I can answer for you. It's not something, Carrie, that you can answer for them. It is solely going to be between them and God, right? And it doesn't matter. It's not just homosexuality. It could be greed. It could be lust. It could be adultery. It could be a whole plethora of sin that the Bible outlines. But if, if you are living a life that is marked by sin and yet still identifying as a Christian, I believe first and foremost, it's got to be a heart check and it's got to be recognizing, do I truly know Jesus? right? That's the very first question that we have to address is, do I know Jesus? And I'm, he's just got me on this journey and he's slowly, but surely as, I mean, it's not wasted on me that he put me on this seventh month journey to call me out of my sin. Or do I have no qualms whatsoever, right? Do I, do I think that the Bible's wrong or my pastor's wrong or thousands of years of church history is wrong? And I'm just going to go live my life well, I have a really hard time seeing that in scripture. Mm -hmm. And so first and foremost, that's what I think you're going to wrestle with um, is, do you know Christ? Are you truly saved? Have you, have you placed, truly faced your, placed your faith in him? But then also, if you're that Christian who is scared, it's okay to be scared, right? Um, we see countless testimonies of, of men and women in the gospel where God was calling them to do really, really hard things and to leave their comfort zone. I think of Gideon from Judges, right, who um, is greeted and this mighty warrior, right, and Gideon's hiding. And, and so God called him out and shaped him and changed him, right? And so God is going to call us to leave these places for what, what he has called us to. And so my advice to you is just to lean on the Lord, right? Don't count anything out, right? And so maybe you are a Christian who, who has same-sex desires and you've struggled and you've, you may have identified as gay, but maybe you don't want to. Just trust in God. Surround yourself with people who are going to speak truth to you. Don't run to these churches who um, are, are twisting truth and coming up with ideas that go against the, the witness of the church, the witness of the Bible, the witness of God, right? 
and but surround yourself with people who are going to proclaim truth to you and and also trust that that god has your best interests at heart um, because his best interests are in your best interest right and his best interests are always for us to turn away from sinfulness and to turn towards holiness Right. I always think of the prodigal son's story because, you know, when the son turned and started to go home, the father ran to him. He didn't yeah. say, well, you have explaining to do. You know, the father ran to him and hugged him and he killed the fatted calf. He just was all in. I'm so glad you're home. And that's our Lord. That's what he does for everybody who says, show me, show me. I'm willing. You know? Well, and I think too, um, so often we put pressure on ourselves that it's just us right it's we've got to do all this on our own but the fact is y'all we've never been on our own right. right so my college professor talked about deism and this idea that god wound creation and then stepped back y'all my life is living proof that god has his hand in creation that god has his hand in moving and shaping our lives and so you're never alone at this god is always with you okay. and so he's never just going to stop and leave you there he's always shaping you and walking with you to the next destination right. and my is marked by that right so mm -hmm. he calls me out of homosexuality that was golly five years ago i now have five more years of god just moving and blessing and just incredible stories that are just as incredible as the stories of how he called me at first Amen. And it really is. It's Holy Spirit that comes and lives with us and helps us and walks us through these things. You know, yes, you know, Father God is in heaven and you'll say Jesus is on the throne. He sent Holy Spirit to dwell with us, to help us through these wrestles because he knew we were going to wrestle. And Absolutely. so he's our helper. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Cody. Oh, Thank no you so much. It's been such a joy to have you share. I love his story in you. I love the joy that you have on your face. It's just, it's radiant. Well, I love living it, right? I love every single day, just again, realizing that God's real and this life is not all there is and that he loves us, so. Amen. And so anybody who's listening, you too can have that joy because that joy's name is God. God is the joy. And just ask him, say, I want to know you, God. I want to be willing to do life with you please just show me and he will he will thanks so much for watching today please like share subscribe help people to know that god is still moving